Okay, um, thanks for having me discuss this paper. Um, so, a disclaimer, Jason sent me a slides before I asked him, so I will assume you guys understood the big picture of the model, how the mechanism works, uh, and I will dive into other things of the paper. Okay, you know, what sort of the basic thing we're dealing with, we're dealing with the fact that debt is complicated, and most of the time you write debt as pretty simple, um, it's a claim on the firm, I owe you $50 a year from now. If you pay me the $50, it's all good. If you don't, the firm goes bankrupt. Um, if you've ever looked at either capital structure of a firm, you've seen there's many positions in the typical capital structure of the firm. You have secure debt, you have unsecured debt, and so on. Uh, and then if you've actually ever looked at a debt agreement, you'd be surprised that it doesn't say you owe me $50 in a year. It's sort of, it's a thing that's like yay thick and you know, has many qualifications, and those qualifications we call covenants, uh, and they're quite common. Uh, so we probably, they, they probably matter. Uh, if you look at bank debt, over 90% of bank debt con uh, con uh, contains at least one financial covenant. Uh, other sort of very standard covenants are, are there anyway. Over two thirds of bonds have covenants. So I think this is in some ways something we should be spending time on, and we have been spending time on especially on the empirical side of the literature. Okay? The empirical literature on this has been enormous, if you've been following it at all over the last 15, 20 years. Right? We know which firms issue which covenants. Um, and this is kind of important. The literature has been very lazy about distinguishing bond covenants and bank covenants, and I'll come back to that. It'll actually matter quite a lot. Uh, which firms violate their covenants, how frequently they violate co their covenants, what happens after covenants get violated. Right? Enormous literature. There's been a theory literature that's, I would say, comparably small-ish. Um, and I would say there's a couple of things in the literature that you has been focusing on. Pro primarily, it's how do covenants resolve the conflict of interest between equity and debt. Um, most of the time, it's focused on one class of debt. And as you know, if you have one class of debt, talking about secured versus unsecured debt kind of makes no sense, because all debt is, in principle, sort of secured if you just have one class forever. Um, and I think if I'm putting my words in the author's mouth, because they're not saying this, um, one thing the theory has done is, both as a feature and as a bug, been quite abstract about covenants. Covenants are sort of state contingent control rights of creditors, and that's great in some ways. And I would say what this paper shows is sometimes this is a bug. We've been missing some important features of debt because we've been thinking about them a little bit too far off. Okay? So, Big picture, I think, where this paper comes in for me is, is ask the question, well, how do creditors obtain these contingent control rights? In principle, covenants are, you know, a state of the world happens, creditors get to make some decisions in the firm. But in practice, you know, how do they grab their control rights over investment, debt issuance, and so on, conditional covenants being violated and the firm not being in bankruptcy? Because if it's in bankruptcy, we know how they get control rights. Uh, the way covenants a lot of times, but not always, work in practice is if a covenant is violated, you have the right to accelerate that. So you don't have the right to tell firm, the firm, hey, you can't buy another firm, or you can't do app, uh, CapEx, or you cannot pay dividends, which are, by the way, all covenants you see. You can only say, if you violate that, sort of, you know, the clause 14.1 of an actual agreement, then as soon as the, borrower, uh, the lender decides, your debt is due immediately. No whining, no complaining, none of the other stuff. If we want the repayment immediately, you owe us. Okay? And then, of course, if you can't repay, you go into default, uh, and so on. Okay? There is actually some other things here. Um, for example, any credit line normally gets shortened. Okay? That also gets sort of, is normally a, a covenant violation clause. Okay? So this is kind of big picture. When a covenant gets violated, that gets accelerated. So this paper kind of says, wait a second, most of the literature has kind of assumed when a covenant is violated, then the borrower and lender sit down, they renegotiate, and then we sort of come to some good agreement, and we live happily ever after. Okay? But is the threat to accelerate debt credible at all? Is there anything to say once a covenant gets violated? And they sort of put out this poster child of credibility, which is a negative pledge covenant. Right? And the null hypothesis they pull from the legal literature, at least from a few legal papers, is, you know, accelerating that is not credible at all with a negative pledge clause. Why not? Well, 
you violate the covenant, issue some senior debt, and then I complain, it's too late. I'm sorry, those assets are gone, you have no claim. There's no point in actually um, calling that right now. Okay? So this paper does two things. It says, number one, when is the threat to call debt credible? The threat is credible only if A, there is other unsecured debt, B, this unsecured debt has no, other, um, has no covenants, um, C, this will be efficient okay, if um, you have a very specific set of projects in the firm. Okay, so we're going to talk about those things. Okay? So you would see these. So A, this is credible. B, you might see this uh, negative pledge covenants because efficient capital structure. Okay? But you would see them paired with other unsecured debt. Otherwise, you wouldn't see them. OK, so I'm going to talk about two broad issues. One is, does the institutional setup support the mechanism that's in the paper. Second, I'm going to flesh out some other empirical predictions using the same set of papers that the authors use uh, to support their argument and see how they stack up uh, in, the, in the data. Okay? So let's start with the institutions. Um, there are broadly three things that you require for negative pledge covenants to be efficient and therefore to exist. Okay? These are Number one, you have to have efficient ex post renegotiation, right? If you have a lot of frictions in ex post renegotiation, this won't work very well. Two, you need to have the presence of other unsecured debt. Three, a specific project structure, okay? Efficient renegotiation, I think, and this, I don't actually blame the authors. If you look at the empirical literature, things are all over the place because if you, only if you read the data section will people tell you, are they doing covenants on bonds or banks? So negative pledge covenants, 44% of them of debt has negative pledge covenants really means 44% of bonds have negative pledge covenants. Bank debt doesn't really have negative pledge covenants. I'll come back to that later. Um, they have something that's a little bit different. Okay. And bonds are, you know, if you look at the Trust Indenture Act of 1939, quite difficult to renegotiate. Pretty much you need unanimity on the books to be able to do so. Now, that would be an issue here, right? If, like, imagine there's one bondholder that loses the thing in the mail that says, please waive this covenant violation. All of a sudden, you get in a pretty inefficient thing. So the question is, is it sort of true? Are bonds sort of hard to renegotiate? Um, I mean, you could, in principle, call bonds. So that means you need a callable provision. Uh, and you, the question is, at what price can you call these bonds? Uh, is that you know, gonna have the free rider problem not going to destroy the, any credibility you have there? Um, the other thing you could do, and this happens, but from my understanding, only in pretty distressed bonds, is you can do something that seems a little bit sketchy. It's actually a, called a distressed debt exchange offer. Uh, in a distressed exchange offer, you pretty much tell people, hey, we're going to trade these bonds for other bonds, and you don't need unanimity, you need a supermajority. So that's better than unanimity. It's not quite we we'll all work as a happy collective. Um, so the idea that sort of negative pledge covenants are super efficient to renegotiate, I think is a little bit problematic for bonds. You might think, well, okay, fine, we're, but the, this is really a paper about bank debt. Now, I think in the data, you actually see that there, banks do take out their pound of flesh when you renegotiate, uh, even bank loans. There's like amendment fees and so on that we don't talk about. But I think more importantly, um, if you look at bank covenants, Bank covenants are a little bit different. They're not, not actually negative pledge covenants. Um, what happens is first, bank loans are frequently secured. And here it's critical that negative pledge covenants live in unsecured debt. The second thing is that when you have leverage-like covenants in bank debt, they're much more what we call maintenance covenants, which means they're explicitly conditioned on the state of the world. Um, the negative pledge covenants in the model are by design, not conditioned on the state of the world. Uh, so I think, so I'm not quite sure this sort of fits. So the alternative might be that negative pledge covenants in bonds are actually a pretty darn good way for bondholders to tie their hands. Um, so I, I don't think we have good, good enough explicit evidence to work through how often negative pledge covenants get waived, but I think I'd like to see that, okay? Uh, the other thing we need for negative pledge covenants to be efficient is there has to be other unsecured debt 
without covenants present. Okay? What's interesting is if you look at this billet paper that has the 44% um, a share of bonds have negative performance clauses, turns out actually 51% of bonds have cross default clauses, which means if any other debt holder defaults, then everybody gets accelerated. Okay? Um, if that's the case, um, then that actually doesn't give you priority over other unsecured debt without covenant, negative pledge covenants. Um, so I couldn't quite figure out how much overlap there is between this 51% and 44. I think if, for the author's mechanism, the important thing is these are sort of completely separate firms. If it's in the same firm, the mechanism doesn't really work. Uh, the last piece is negative pledge covenants. This is sort of some sophisticated Googling on my part. And again, we don't have good measurement. But turns out there's, there, there exists negative pledge pari passu covenants, which means that if you violate the negative pledge covenant, you become pari passu with any secured debt that was issued afterwards. At that point, your threat to convert becomes quite credible. Okay, so that's sort of broadly on the, on the institutions. I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, the second part of the discussion I want to talk about a little bit is the link between model and evidence. Uh, and let me be very precise here. Most of the evidence I'm going to show now, it's the same evidence that the author shows, so I'm kind of kosher. On the other hand, it's about bond. Most of it is about violations of bank debt, not bonds, and it's specifically not negative pledge covenants. But if we sort of take the model seriously and examine that evidence, what are some of the other predictions of the model? Covenants get violated in good states of the world. So good things, ha you have a good investment opportunity, you violate the covenant, you issue more secure debt, and you invest more. Okay, that's sort of the basic idea in the model. So this is uh, Nini Sufi Smith, 2012, uh, and sort of they look at what happens First, pre-violation of covenant. I mean, and you can see these are sort of firms with declining performance, declining operating cash flows, market to book, leverage. I think this is book leverage goes up, interest expenses go up. These are firms in distress. Okay? These are not firms that have amazing opportunities to roll into them. Uh, conditional covenant violation. Again, this is not violating negative pledge covenants. This is any covenants. We don't have the specific evidence. Uh, but on average, covenant violations which are frequent result in le less capex, less M oh, less M and A. Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Less M and A, and so on. And they coincide with less debt issuance rather than more. So the problem in, is is not with the model or the data, but with the link between the model and the data. That the data we have is not about the specific thing the authors are studying, but they are citing this as support for other things that the model predicts. So I don't think you can have it all. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is covenants in the cross section. I think it's, there's two important things uh, that the model predicts in the cross section. First is, it's got to be that covenants are in firms that at least are going to have some potential good opportunities. The second thing, which I thought, when I thought about it, I thought it was quite interesting, is covenants, negative pledge covenants, are efficient only in so far as there is a negative correlation between how good a project is and the pledgeable cash flows. In other words, better projects, less pledgeable cash flows. So I don't know how Adriano feels about this. Sort of if you have theta K models, uh, then pledgeable cash flows scale with, with, with cash flows, um, especially with quality. You multiply them by, by something. So I, I sort of, I want to know who wins. Um, is Adriano right in writing his theta K times profitability models, or, or this. And that's important because we see these negative pledge covenants in 44% of bonds. Um, so that's a huge share of firms that have this negative correlation. So I wanted to know a little bit more sort of where are we expecting to see these type of projects with, with this sort of quite important and interesting divergence. Um, the other thing that didn't quite square with me is if you've ever looked at covenant data, covenants are in bad firms. As firms get worse, you can see more covenants. In the cross-section, worse firms have more covenants. And I don't know whether that's about, you know, that doesn't strike me as firms with great investment opportunities necessarily. And I don't know that that says to me much about a correlation of pledgeable cash flows and, and, uh, and success. Um, but that's, that's sort of a couple of things where, where I wanted to see things fleshed out. So to conclude, I think this is a, Important topic, I think we need to think carefully about how different covenants work.
both individual covenants. I think the authors showed us that if you think about something specific as negative pledge covenants, that has implications on how you negotiate them. That's going to be quite different than if it's a leverage covenant, if it's a coverage ratio covenant, which is like state specific. Uh, we need to think about how to enforce them. And I think in a bigger picture, if you've ever looked at these things, there's almost no firms or no debt agreements that have one covenant. There's a whole sequence of covenants. So we can either think about them as broadly, yeah, there's a state contingent control right thing, or we start thinking about how these things play together. And the authors start thinking about how covenants play together with uh, sen uh, seniority or you know, secure debt, to be precise. Uh, and this is a nice paper on are covenant violations enforceable and how, which we really haven't thought about very much. Um, I am not sure whether negative pledge covenants are a poster child for it's hard to enforce simply because they're in bonds. Uh, so if the authors just show me evidence that in bonds these things get waived all the time, super happy. Um, I think this is a paper about more about bond covenants, but bond covenants are a lot of times on secure debt and they're state contingent. So then we need a little bit of a different model, I think. Uh, but I learned a lot uh, reading this, so thank you very much.